It's time for fun, learning, commentary, laughs, and more. Care of the most diverse group in the genealogy and family history world. Welcome to Black Pro Gen Live with your hosts, Nika and True, and the baddest panel in these pedigree streets. Angela, James, Linda, Alex, Ellen, Tony, Shelly, Teresa, Bernice, Felicia, Willie, Renata, and Tasia. It's Black Pro Gen Live, genealogy, family history research with flavor. Hello and good evening, everyone. I am your girl, True Lewis, and I'm going to be your co-host for the evening. And I just want to welcome everybody near and far, old and new to Black Pro Gen Live. So, you know, we all appreciate you coming out to our special episode 30 minutes prior to what we just had. And we just welcome you all back. And I'm just so excited. Tonight we got two special guests, but now I'm going to turn over my hot mic to your girl and our host, Nika Smith. <laughs> girl, the mic is hot. It's a hot one tonight. Lord, I know uh, we got feedback that the episode fell a little short for everybody, but that's all right. We'll that's be all back. right. We made it through. Yeah, we'll be back. That's that's a that's a conversation that is gonna continue. It's not gonna end. So don't feel like you know we just we just left you out there hanging. Hanging. <laughs> yeah, but you know, as we mentioned, we're gonna have a whole episode that's gonna talk mm -hmm. about some of those topics. But you know what? We're done with that because guess what? We're gonna get into the subject matter of the evening. Tonight's episode: recent news about some of America's elite universities having ties to slavery has been eye-opening. Thanks for tuning in to learn about specific institutions institutions, their connections, and how to verify if your ancestors were involved. Tonight's episode is Slavery in the Ivy League Universities, and it's airing tonight. And we're joined by a couple of special guests, but let me go through some housekeeping stuff before we get to their official bios. Have a question or comment? Join the conversation now. Participate in the live chat on YouTube to the top right hand of the screen if you're watching on a computer and at the bottom of the YouTube app on your mobile device. Also, free, feel free to weigh in on Twitter by tweeting us at BlackProGen or use the hashtag BlackProGen. If you've ever been like, you know what, I'm so mad I missed that show. I wish I could have watched it live. I would have questions, whatever. Here is your reminder to set reminders. All you need to do is head to my YouTube channel and set, click set reminder under the episode you're interested in in the upcoming live stream area. Or you can just subscribe to the channel. And anytime I go live or anytime I post anything on the channel, it will come up in your subscription feed. If you're tired like we are of seeing Confederate flag ships, flowers, and the wrong oil paintings, and my personal favorite, and I don't know if this happened with y'all, is when they put an actual photo of somebody that died before photography was created. That that's that's one of my favorites that that I've seen, and I just can understand how a person who died before photography was actually created has a photo. If you're tired of seeing that, Black Pro Gym Live is here to save the day. Download our new icons for online tree profiles today. We're adding new ones all the time. So if we miss something, be sure to let us know. Also, do you love or hate the topics we discussed this year? Well, here is your chance to give feedback on the potential topics for 2019. Participate in our viewer survey today. True is putting the link in the chat so you can participate. And we thank you all who have already submitted your suggestions for 2019. Don't forget there are nearly, actually there are 70 episodes because this is episode 70 that have already aired on a number of topics. So be sure to check out the All Seasons playlist before you give your suggestions. There were a few folks that gave suggestions for episodes we actually had already done. So um, unless you want us to do a reboot or something else, be sure to let us know. All right. So we're going to get to the bios of our special guests. The first is Leontini Clay Peck. Mrs. Peck is an 
educator, author, and speaker with more than 30 years experience in presenting African-American cultural programs and family genealogy stories. She received her education from American University, the American University of Rome, and West Virginia University. She has taught African-American studies, sociology, and state and local government classes. She gives presentations to educational institutions, faith organizations, libraries, genealogical societies, and private businesses on her experience in finding her roots uh, and encouraging others to search for their ancestors. She can trace her roots to John Clay, who arrived in America in 16. 13. Her ancestry is also connected to Benjamin Banneker, Civil War soldier Job Gator, as well as the enslaved communities of Presidents James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. Give a virtual round of applause to Miss Leontony, who is officially one of our aunties now on the show. Our other guest is my boo. I love her. Karen Harper Royal. Karen Harper Royal is an executive director of the GU 272 Descendants Association and a co-host of the genealogy television show, Nurture Our Roots. She is also the assistant director of Pyramid Community Parent Resource Center, where she is training the next generation of parent advocates for children with disabilities. She is one of the producers of A Perfect Storm, the takeover of New Orleans public schools. Yes, because we got to talk, that's a whole other episode, talking about the charter schools in New Orleans, but I digress. She consulted with the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center and contributed to research on reforms and organizations studying the education reforms in post-Katrina New Orleans. She has served is a member of the National Journey for Justice Alliance and the Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools and is a founding member of the Louisiana Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools. Mrs. Harper Royal is a mother of two sons, one a pre-Katrina graduate of New Orleans Public Schools and one who is a post-Katrina graduate of New Orleans Public Schools. All right, let me go ahead so everybody can say hi to all the people. Hey, we got a full panel tonight, including two new aunties who don't know their aunties, but they're officially a part of the auntie group. Everybody come off mute. First person I'm gonna go to is the furthest out west. We are so glad that you were able to join us tonight considering that it is only six o'clock, you haven't had your dinner and you're over there drinking Starbucks. How is our <laughs> baby, Alex? I am good and I'm so glad to be a part of the panel tonight and I'm so glad to learn and share what I know. Let's go. Let's go. He, <laughs> the baby is ready. He's like, let's go. All right. Fresh off an of episode where we hit on eugenics and we talked about people assigning uh, identities to folks is Dr. Ellen fernandez Sacco. How hey. you doing, girl? All right. I survived that episode. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, just so you all know, she has an awesome paper that she just wrote on this topic it is i got all the sourcing just everything and i and you just say you heard about ellen and, and eugenics here on black pro gen live <laughs> first before somebody tries to co-op that topic because we know people watching steal topics from us we're yes. not stupid <laughs> they do it we know that all the time so anywho renata how are you Okay, am I off mute this time? You You're are. Off. <laughs> okay, yay. I'm doing fine. Hi, everybody. It's Renata Yabro Sanders coming to you from Newport News, Virginia. All right, our other Virginian in the house, Miss Lady in Red with the tree over her head, <laughs> Shelly Murphy. The lady in purple is doing great, AKA family tree girl. <laughs> All right, it looks like red to me. It might be my screen. I don't know. It's a, it's a color. <laughs> <laughs> I survived the special episode also. You did. You did. You did a great job. She totally did. All right. Teresa, who was hey. white at birth, but is no longer. <laughs> right. How are you? Never was. <laughs> hey. I'm, I'm, I'm here uptown near the Boogie Down in New York City. And tonight I'm rocking. I don't know if you see this. My humanity t-shirt from mindfult-shirts.com. I had to say that we wouldn't be legit if we didn't. Yeah, we it's have a statement t-shirts. We're a statement t-shirt show. All right. True Lewis, Fort Knox, Kentucky, garden all of the booty for the country there. How are you, girl? You survived the special episode. I know. I got frazzled there for just a second, but I was good to go. Oh, that was... <laughs> That was wild. And then I had to watch that documentary came on like, yes, that so was we not didn't even a bring, coincidence. We yeah. didn't even bring that up. Let me just go ahead and just drop that on your spirit right now. Yes. So um, if you do not follow American Experience on PBS, yes. I'm going to need you to get all your genealogical life and historical life together right now. Um, 
American Experience is an amazing show where they talk about it's different documentaries on different aspects of American life. It just so happens that the episode that aired last week was on eugenics mm. and it was very good and it was two hours and it will get you so mad because you'll start thinking about all the systems that we have that were driven by the eugenics movement, mm -hmm. our industry being one. So mm -hmm. um, when you see how they trained the people to do the eugenics studies, it literally is go like going to IGHR or Maggie. It is literally what we are training people to do right now. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I'm telling you, we that's the episode for next year. <laughs> all right. Aunties, new auntie, say hello to the people so they know which one of you is, is smiling. Uh, we'll go with Miss Leontini first. Hello. I love being an auntie. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. We are I glad. Love it. We are thank glad. Miss Karen, even though you are technically with me right now <laughs> in the state of Tennessee, how yes, are I you? <laughs> Good, good, good. All right. Well, we've got all the way from Murfreesboro. <laughs> yeah, she is all the way from Murfreesboro, even though she would be she would be in New, in New Orleans. But you know that's all right. She's got she's got other obligations that she's that she's participating in this week, which is the uh, slave dwelling. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's slave slave conference. Yeah, she's at the slave. Oh, dwelling. okay. Yeah. yeah With so Joe she, McGill. Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. A good a friend of mine. Yes, yeah. yes. Look at Love all the that. connections. Look at all the connections. Look, and there, yeah, there are people in the chat room. We want to say hello. There's some new folks that I am uh, <laughs> that I'm seeing in the chat room, including Miss Karen, who can multitask. I love her. <laughs> uh, Cecilia Matoro Charles, we love you. Thanks for joining us. My cousin Raymond Reeves. Hey, boo, what's going on, Chisholm? We love Tony Carrier, one of Black Virgin Life panelists, is in the chat room along with our genealogy buddy and DNA buddy Shannon Christmas, uh, Mavis Jones, Joyce McClendon. Yvette Portermore has joined us, y'all. Can you believe it? I think I talked her up because I just saw an episode with her on it early on. And I was like, mm -hmm. Yvette never joined us again. And then here mm -hmm. she is. Tyrone Craft, Wanda Looney, we love you. Thanks for joining us. Oh, Kristen Clegg is out in the house tonight. Good old buddy Carmen hey. Dale Colston. There are people checking in from all over the place. Hopefully Tom Reed made it back to his house with the Del He's Taco. He's right there eating okay. his Del Taco. <laughs> eating his Del Taco now. I was going to ask that question. All right, all right. So let's get into our topic at hand. Woo we meaty subject, Lord, today. Y'all know. If you follow me, you know that I recently released some of the information that I've gathered over the last year about my family's ties to what's considered for some the Ivy League of the South. Yeah, boo. Um, and how uh, the person who wrote the legislation, who's considered the father of Old Miss, owned my family. And I, I think this episode is totally appropriate because so many people are finding out about how many systems within our country were involved in slavery and that it wasn't so much just a, you know, uh, you know, slaveholder in the way that we look at it you know, in a big house type of situation that that there were organizations and structures that were involved in the trade because it created money, it created capital, it made people rich. So naturally, it's not just gonna be individuals who are involved, it's going to be entities who are involved. So um, the first question I have for tonight's discussion is why do you think the history of Ivy League universities and really also just universities, their ties to slavery has gone largely unnoticed? And we'll let the we'll let the aunties, the uh, new aunties answer first, and then we'll have the rest of the panel weigh in after them. Uh, well, this is uh, go ahead, Leah. Go <laughs> I was going to say that um, when we look at the plantation and the aristocracy, those communities, um, protected class, privilege, I think they still want to be able to um, keep it a secret. The secrets have been exposed. And I actually wish I had heard the uh, previous session that you had on eugenics because it ties in with the University of Virginia as Dr. Shelley Murphy and many of you know. So I think that it's uh, one of those secrets that's now the door has been busted open on the secrets. So maybe more public institutions um, may not have been as frightful, but when you're looking at privilege, the plantation, the aristocracy, it's the dirty little secret. That's how they made their money. So that's 
the short answer. I also think it's because it doesn't fit into what people what people's uh, picture in their head is about uh, the plantation system. They don't think of universities when they think of slaveholding. They think of uh, the Southern plantation concept. And uh, they just don't think of uh, universities and how universities benefited from plantation. Uh, even if the universities did not have uh, a plantation uh, set up on its grounds, universities benefited as in the case of uh, the Jesuit uh, plantations having many universities benefit. Mm -hmm. Panel, you wanna weigh in? No. Yeah, I think I agree with the dirty little secret, but it still goes back to the basic knowledge that we know and that most of us all research is slavery was about economics mm -hmm. and they needed labor and they were too cheap to pay for it, period. And so you look at UVA, other universities, even up there, Georgetown and things like that, beautiful, massive buildings that are still standing. Some that could have were built back in those early 1800s and things like that. Those were built by the hands of slaves and different plantations had slaves besides the ownership of some of those slaves, right? With the college professors or with the university itself. So I think they figured out a way to get these things built with free labor and on the backs of people of color. And um, unfortunately, like Leanthony said, that door is busted open. Everybody's got to come out now. And mm -hmm. most of them at this point are jumping out ahead and saying, oh, we're doing this research now to be able to memorialize and so on and so forth. So I think we'll find out more and more and it won't just be the big Ivy League schools. I think everybody that was open during that time had a part in it. I wanna jump in and just speak right. to and speak to the popularity and the momentum that the calling out some of these universities has. I think that it ties into the fact that there's so many memorial conversations or um, statue conversations about removing better statues and racist statues and so on and so forth. Um, I think that that definitely builds into it. We also have over the last, I think maybe four or five decades where reparations politics has definitely come into to the present when you have corporations being sued and um, banks and businesses being sued. We have to think about how that also ties into universities, institutions and the like, other than just the old run of the mill plantation slavery system that it also reached every corner of our country's economy and every, every corner of this country in general. I would Renata. also, I, oh, I'm sorry. Renata's next, please. Um, I was just gonna say, I'm, you know, I'm a, uh, graduate of the University of Virginia. And I just have been amazed by the work that was done um, that was recently uh, concluded by the commission on the president's commission on slavery. Uh, hopefully we can post a link to the report from that. Um, you know, when I went there, of course, you know, there was this, this kind of knowledge that, okay, the buildings, a lot of the buildings were probably built by enslaved people and that kind of thing. But everything that's been disclosed about even down to the students bringing enslaved people with them and mm -hmm. having, you know, them mm -hmm. to wait on them while they were in school. And, you know, if you're familiar with the lawn at UVA, you know that, you know, each room has its own fireplace and they mm -hmm. had their enslaved servants, you know, to light the fires and do mm -hmm. all that. Like, just revisiting all of that almost 40 years after I graduated, it's just been uh, very eye-opening. And I don't think most of my friends and I, you know, had any idea or had even thought beyond the physical labor that you know was done anywhere around here in Virginia, North Carolina, anywhere in this area, when you have old buildings, you can assume that the physical labor was done by enslaved individuals. So it's just been very, mm -hmm eye-opening. Um, one quick other little note to that. 
there's a cemetery on grounds, which is what we call campus at UVA, um, that I can't really talk about it, but it had something to do with me pledging my sorority. And I you know, learned when we were there for Joe's program mm -hmm. last year that there's a section of that cemetery that has you know, enslaved individuals buried mm -hmm. in it. And we had no idea when we were traipsing around in that cemetery at night, <laughs> you know, whose graves we were, were walking over. Just very interesting. Teresa? I was gonna say, I'm uh, representing Rutgers University here, someone in the chat room. Uh, Dale just mentioned this book, uh, Scarlet and Black. I want to say, you know, in the North, you're not dealing again with large plantations, but you're dealing with the same sort of historical erasure of people who actively contributed to these institutions. They were erased from history. We know those on in power wanted to maintain that power for generations to come. Um, what I find fascinating, though, I believe Tyrone also pointed in the chat room is you got to look to the archives. In this book, there is a whole chapter on Middlesex County, which is where my ancestors come from. came from. Not only that, all of the people that I've been talking about for years, be it in, in Connecticut, Westchester, New, New York City, New Jersey, you're dealing with the same colonial families, the F Livingstons, the Phillips family, the people who own my ancestors, the Black Belts. They were part of the institution, and yet you don't hear about those people who were actually working for them, building the, the buildings, laboring for centuries, they're erased. So, you know, now we're talking about bringing it home and telling the truth. Yeah, we're being like Andrew Gillum tonight, bring it home. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have to also add in too, I talked about Ole Miss, the same family that had dealings with the, with the creation of Ole Miss and you know, we're based, they have a building name after them at the school. These same people were also part of Amherst College, which some people consider that to be an Ivy League. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when we're talking about this whole discussion about slavery and really universities, in particular Ivy Leagues, we have to talk about how lucrative this was, right? How much money was involved with this? Um, and, and, I mean, because it had to be of benefit for these for these universities to be involved, right? Because it wasn't, and that's the thing, we can't just say, okay, it's the university. You have to look at the founders, the mm -hmm. trustees, because they provided money to these places to keep them open. And some of that money could have been derived from slavery. I know my ancestor had a plantation in Louisiana and Mississippi and left, his brother uh, took it over and then he opened up a cotton textile mill. Where did the cotton come from? It came from Mississippi. The mill was in Massachusetts. Where was the school in Massachusetts? Where was the money coming from? Really, it was coming mm -hmm. from Mississippi. So, mm -hmm. um, new aunties, <laughs> how lucrative was it for the organiz for the uh, schools that that you've been working with? Miss Leontini used University of Virginia, and um, Miss Karen is Georgetown University. Well, let me put it this way: for the University of Virginia, it is still lucrative. Uh, when we look at even today from, um, from 1817 with Thomas Jefferson and Madison and Monroe and uh, Koch, all of these men, these men were friends. This was a business arrangement. They expected that uh, this, this university would be built, would be maintained in perpetuity by enslaved labor. So even today, if we, and this is what I think is so important about this discussion is because, you know, 200 years ago when uh, enslaved persons built, maintained, sustained this university, today we look at athletics. That's still primarily people of color who are still bringing a lot of money to sustain these institutions. So there has to be, a vehicle in which we address, you know, uh, what happened 200 years ago, because we're the same people, just in a different generation and just in a different suit, but it's the same spirit. So for example, uh, when Renata mentioned the slave cemetery on the campus uh, or grounds of the University of Virginia, about a third or maybe even a little more of the people buried in that cemetery are children. 
So mm -hmm. the enslaved workers at the university, not these weren't adults, these were children working for the students and building. There were children raped uh, and marginalized and beaten. Um, this is a horrible system to go through. So it's not, you know, we have to connect the dots. This is not in isolation. Um, even up until the 1960s, you know, we're talking people not being able to come because Thomas Jefferson and the other ones that I mentioned, this was to be sustained until today. <laughs> so we have to, and, and, I, and I'm happy to say that the, the uh, President's Commission uh, and the university, I was a member of that, and they have made strides and we're, will continue to make more strides in addressing this. So they're not just turning a blind eye to it. And you can't have 200 years of this type of oppression um, and, and, and really disregard for, for humanity and change it overnight. It's going to take a long period of time. But I think that the University of Virginia is moving in the right direction. And as Renata had mentioned, there is a, um, a document, actually I have it, that was released and we can probably provide the link to it. It's the slavery uh, and the university and it's really good in it. You know, so it, it's a, a compilation of the work that had been taking place over the past five years with more work to, to come. So these, these universities, um, they have to pay what I always say, pay the piper. We, this just cannot go unaddressed. So the big money to be made and to this day, still money being made. And I, I before Miss Karen chimes in, I just want to say, cause you know, my husband is a, is a high school football coach and he spends a, a ton of his time once the season is over on recruiting mm -hmm. a ton of time. Mm -hmm. And I find it ironic that the reason why usually for a lot of schools, the cost of, of admission has gone up, right? Or the cost of tuition has gone up is because they're building these mammoth stadiums and student mm -hmm. centers to support these teams. So that makes the cost of everything go up for everybody else. And then these students are not being paid. If you mm -hmm. recall, these universities were so out of control with how much money they were making on the students. I don't know if you guys remember a man named Ed O'Bannon. He used to play for uh -huh. UCLA mm -hmm. and he played basketball. And what the colleges used to do was they used to put out a video game every year for college basketball and college football. Ed O'Bannon said, why are you using my likeness and making money uh -huh. off of it after uh -huh. I'm no longer a student? Uh -huh. So he sued the NCAA. Do you know what they did? Instead of them keeping the game, removing the likenesses of the players, they stopped producing it. That mm -hmm. should tell you everything Not you surprised. need to know about how our athletes are being monetized. Mm -hmm. But I digress because that's a whole other episode. Miss <laughs> mm -hmm. Karen, let's talk about Georgetown and how lucrative it was for the Jesuits who were over Georgetown. Well, the Jesuits had five plantations in Maryland and that financed the Catholic operations in the province of Maryland. And when they sold our ancestors in 1838, uh, a portion of that money went to pay off the debt at Georgetown, which allowed Georgetown to continue. But uh, understand that the Jesuits had universities all over this country. Mm -hmm. And when you stop to think about how owning those plantations and owning our ancestors helped to uh, get uh, uh, Catholicism really rooted, in the Maryland province and in many parts of this country, that was huge. That was huge, not just in uh, religion, but huge in the uh, for uh, producing the rest of these universities and colleges across the country that are Jesuit institutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, many times people like to think about, oh, Georgetown owned slaves. Well, Georgetown was the beneficiary of the sale uh, of those 272 ancestors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Georgetown uh, had many students who actually brought slaves with them to that university. But uh, Georgetown did not necessarily own those 272 ancestors. They were spread across five different plantations that the Jesuits owned in Maryland. 
Anyone else on the panel want to weigh in? Okay, I'll go to the next question. All right, so the next question I have is, um, let's talk about the myriad of ways they were involved. So we have talked about that. We talked about trustees who, you know, their benevolence because, and the, the money they made off of slavery benefited the institution. We talked about uh, how enslaved people were brought to campus as, as a result of students who owned slaves. We talked about how their, ch their children were also brought as well and they were victimized. But in, especially in the case when it comes to Georgetown, the Jesuits sold like, <laughs> they sold people away to keep the, the institution alive, right? Like there would be no Georgetown without the selling of people. Um, are there any other ways that we've seen universities, you all have encountered the panel, anyone's encountered universities being involved indirectly or indirectly with slavery outside of the ways that we talked about tonight so far? To think about medicine and the rise of, uh, and the need for bodies you know, the, and the kind of extractive economy that they, that they had in terms of taking bodies more, mostly of poor and black people from uh, or the surrounding area and then using that and selling them and using them for the dissection courses, you mm -hmm. know, that yes, uh, which Dana Ramey Ferry yeah. talked yeah. about, you know? Yeah, and the Pirates of their Pound of Flesh, she yeah. talked about that at length, where they would go down and get the bodies of enslaved people to have them mm -hmm. as cadavers to be able to work on them. They would dig them up right after they were just literally, if your, your family is grieved over you and they're going out to a grave where you don't even exist anymore because they've dug you up for science. And just because it, was a, uh, it wasn't necessarily a stranger either, I, I had just come across the story of one professor who actually boiled the guy that he owned, it was, it was horrific, you know? And then he strung him up so that he could use his bones for an anatomy class. Mm -hmm. So there's like no limit to the way that, um, the kind of treatment that people received at the end of this. And then it's just, it's just folded under, um, you know, pedagogy or you're not supposed to, um, you know, before it wasn't, it wasn't like a question you could press on, you know, these issues. Well, even if we look at Harriet Lacks um, and people of color, they've used our bodies for experimental right. reasons Harriet. and for medicines, and we weren't compensated for that. And that's uh, another report, again, that we can tie that with the University of Virginia. I think last year there was a study that was done uh, with, with medical uh, uh, students that said they didn't think that black people felt the same pain as whites. I don't know if you remember that study or not. But again, that ties into contemporary mistreatment, those old attitudes from slavery that you're different, that you're not the same, that we can ride, you know, take your body and experiment and do what we want to your body, mm -hmm. even beyond death. So you weren't even free. We'll come and dig you up and do what we right. need to do. Right. And we benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And these universities it, did. Alex? It, it, definitely. I, it, like you guys just took so many words out of my mouth, but I just wanted to reiterate that universities were founded by and for our nation's elite, and really the global elite, because people from all over were coming to American universities. But they were funded by the institution of slavery, essentially. So funded, built by slave labor. We know how that how that's integrated. And then especially the fact that their private wealth was coming from their massive plantations or even just the systems like you were mentioning earlier, Nika, about having a, you know, a cotton uh, mill in Massachusetts, but plantations in Mississippi. This wealth was definitely streamlined directly there in order to support and to sustain the institution of slavery in the nation's economy. Also, just to touch on, as far as institutions involvement with slavery, it may not exactly be um, slave ownership, but let's also discuss that major discussions around abolition or whether people were pro-slavery also occurred on university campuses, especially Harvard. Harvard was known to dismiss several um, lecturers and professors during um, the pre-abolition era for having um, pro-abolitionist views and teaching that. So considering that influence as well is really important. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to touch on was how as genealogists, this affects our research and the research of um, the descendant communities. 
is what that would look like on on paper as far as sleep as far as these institutions involvement with slavery so i really want to hear from from some of you guys on the panels about that also yeah we'll definitely we'll definitely get into that because that that's that's you know we got to wrap it up with a nice little bow um <laughs> at the end because we always we always are driving the point home to everybody that we need to capture our stories we need to document we need to stop waiting for other people to tell our stories and to articulate some of the things we're talking about which is one of the reasons why we have this show is mm -hmm. to do that it's one of the functions of that so um let's talk about documents what type of documents can a researcher you know look for search to unearth ties to these universities. I know in my experience, I didn't discover my tie to Ole Miss Anna Amherst until I literally just performed a Google search on the slaveholder. Like I think people are so one track minded into using the tools that we have, right? Like, yes, you need a hammer, you need a screwdriver. And if you have a screwdriver, you really need a Phillips and a flathead in order to get the <laughs> job done, right? But I can't go into my bathroom, which needs the ceiling repainted in the shower and repaint my shower with a hammer. I can't go into my shower and repaint it with the, the screwdriver. I need a spackle to get all of that loose paint off. And then I need, I also need, you know, the, the stuff to fill in the holes and then I need to paint, which means I need a paint gun or I need a, a roller. I'm bringing this up because folks are so streamlined into ancestry family search that they don't even think about searching Google, which for some of these instances with universities, just Googling the name of the slaveholder or the group involved will provide you with information. That's how I found out. I said, wait a minute, hold on. You have to do your checks. Is the person old enough? Were they in the right place at the right time? You have to verify it's the right people. So let's talk about the the ways the documents that a researcher can search to unearth their family's ties to these institutions what what can they find what can they look for well, diaries one. for one thing yeah i'm sorry diaries, diaries. yeah or journals mm -hmm. and and, well, and as, as you said at uh, you can go to your local historical society they might be having books on the history of these universities uh all the documents that were in scarlet and black Rutgers, of course um, has in their archives. So again, you can go to the school and find that out. It's there. The information yeah. is there. It's up to us to go dig it up. They are not going to say, oh, come, let it, let us tell the true stories. No. So we need to be, again, dig deep, go out journals. Uh, Nika's right. I Google everything. Google, see what's out there. And, and you have to know, um, like, when I was reading Scarlet and Black, I'm I'm forever talking about how all these aristocratic people uh, in Westchester and in New Jersey, they were not only involved in um, the New York to Madagascar slave trade, they were involved in the inter-Caribbean slave trade as well as, um, you know, uh, 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 just West African slave trade and you you have to know these people and who what they did, how they made their money. How did the how do folks in colonial times make their money? And again, don't think because it's in the north that there's no ties to the south. Okay, so yeah. when 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 I'm dealing with you know you can't tell me that anymore. When I find out there were slave coffles in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and there were five slave ships out in 1818, you can't tell me that. So again, we need to just cast a wide net and when we're looking the information is there leontony what what records in with, with regard to uva are are available because we i actually posted the link to the uh, commission um oh, in right. that and i also po po uh, posted the link to the uh study about racial bias and pain assessment that also is in the chat as well for people okay great reference? yes the, yeah, um, before before she answers can i just add to the link that i sent you um nika it's the full um commission website but if they just scroll down there's a a link to the actual report. So if they want to read the actual report, they have to just scroll down a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Leon. Sorry, Leontony. That's okay. The university fortunately has um, wonderful scholars 
But, but before I say anything about the scholarship, I'd just like to make a point that I believe that this is not only just um, a, a research way of finding facts and stories, but this is really a mending of the soul of America. So you have to be vested in this. And we know that we, when we are vested in the truth, it's difficult. People don't want to tell the truth. They often have to be forced to tell the truth. But once they come to that threshold to say, I need to come clean, then you start to find that maybe perhaps during a period of time, there were diaries from sororities and fraternities and families and the nannies and the gardeners and all of these people. The community at large has a lot of stories to tell. And we found that with the University of Virginia to engage the wider community to get a more accurate picture of really what was going on between what we call the, the town and gown to get those pictures. But the University of Virginia's archives um, is very good and the professionals there are always, you know, not well going forward from this this point, um, have been actively engaged in finding a lot of the resources. And then of course we were very blessed to have Dr. Irving Jordan, who is a scholar, to help us find some of those stories. So to have an advocate for someone who's passionate about the truth and restoration is really important. Ms. Karen, um, what type of documents does the, the treasure trove for <laughs> Georgetown with regard to slavery, what kind of stuff do you find in there? Well, at the, the Georgetown Slavery Archives at Georgetown University, of course, there's a treasure trove of Jesuit records uh, that go so far back as having the day book records of the individual priests as they recorded various accounts of their daily operations where we were able to find my husband's uh, fifth great grandparents' names listed. These are people who were born in the uh, 1700s. Um, and then in Louisiana, uh, we were able to uh, find that there was a, a photograph of one of the original 272, uh, Frank Campbell, one of the Terrebonne ancestors, one of the ancestors who were brought to Terrebonne Parish. He was in the personal papers of uh, Robert Ruffin Barrow, one of the uh, Terrebonne Parish slaveholders. Uh, I guess that family had donated their personal papers to that university. And that happens a lot. You'll have the families donating their family records to major universities within the state. So that's a great place to research. If you're trying to find your ancestors, uh, research major slaveholders where you know your family lived, we always say, well, where's the country for you? Where do you go when you go to the country? Well, if you know you always go to Houma, Louisiana, mm -hmm. then maybe uh, <laughs> search the universities in that area. You may find who were the major slaveholders in that area, and you may find your ancestors listed among the personal papers of those people in that area. And that goes for uh, wherever their universities. You'll probably find records of the major slaveholders, especially those universities that are um, around slaveholding states. And I, I just want to uh, let Karen know that Miss Judy's in the chat room. I don't know if you saw her. <laughs> Judy Rifle, who's who's done uh, quite a bit of work with the uh, Georgetown uh, 272, is in the chat room, and she's and she's like, we're using probate inventories and sale and conveyance records and mortgage records, absolutely, which that is the basics of doing enslaved research, mm -hmm. right? You're turning over every stone to try to get whatever okay. clue you can, and an additional thing that's being used is DNA, because I share DNA with quite a few Georgetown. 272 descendants, even though I haven't found anybody in my family who is, but people have, from my end, have married folks who have descendancy from that. So it's another tool that's being used to identify uh, connections to these universities. We talked about personal papers. We talked about, you know, just the, the bare bones basics of doing genealogy research on enslaved populations. We have a whole episode, we have several episodes where we talk about tracing enslaved people. So, you know, this is not 
just that episode. Go back to that one. I forget what number it was, but it was this season. It was in February. Um, and that was the episode we had Chris Haley on from the Maryland State Archives. Yeah. So, you know, do those same things um, when you're looking for these folks. And um, we, we talked about not being shy to go to the actual institution to see what they have and ask, right? Mm -hmm. Say, I believe my ancestors were held as slaves by someone affiliated with this, this institution. What documents do you have? Maybe they may or may or may not be available for circulation. A lot of these, a lot of these uh, universities, they have great uh, documentation of what they hold online. And if you're doing a good search, you might actually pull up some of those records and it'll tell you which school or which library to go to, whether or not it circulates, all that other kind of stuff. Um, that's how I found out Israel had, Trask had, had ties to Amherst College, the five colleges had his papers. And it also mentioned the fact that he had to emancipate two of his slaves because he brought them up from Mississippi and he had them in Massachusetts longer than a year. So legally he had to emancipate them. Mm -hmm. And that was among his papers that are there. And eventually my cousin Jean's in the, in the chat room. I have to go to her house and stay because she lives there <laughs> to go into research. All right. So Miss Leontini, can you just tell us about how you first learned about your connection to the University of Virginia. And then after that, talk about your work and connection with the group of descendants. Okay. Um, when I first moved to uh, Charlottesville, I was employed at the University of Virginia and uh, in the medical center. And I would walk down the hallway and the hallway was called Jordan Hall. And I always got creepy feelings uh, for some reason, not knowing why. Long story short, I found that uh, that building was named um, in honor of the eugenicist, Dr. Jordan. It has since been named in honor of Dr. Uh, Vivian Penn, an African-American uh, medical doctor. So I um, got involved with the university from working there. And then I've always been involved with African-American history and culture. But the people in Charlottesville, Virginia would always ask, and Shelly can attest to this, why did you move to Charlottesville? Who in the world in their, in their right mind would move to Charlottesville? It's a beautiful, beautiful area, but has a lot of dark secrets in its soul and in its bones. So when working at the university, I got involved with a, with a group called UCARE, and they were involved with racial equity. Long story short, I ended up getting involved with um, the President's Commission uh, on Slavery in the University. So through those efforts, for five years, working with trying to make some substantive change um, at the university and the community. When I found out um, about my connection, to Montpelier and to uh, uh, Monticello, it was only simply by accident and by doing my genealogy. And I think it's because, well, I know it's because I'm a descendant of Henry Clay and Henry Clay was a contemporary of, you know, of our founding fathers. And I always say that they were doing some hippity dippity in the wood yard. <laughs> <laughs> and as a consequence, <laughs> I'm here and, you know, and I'm related to these, related to these people. So, but I didn't know that in, until I moved here. So that gave me more of a, uh, the, an invested interest in trying to do what was right in this community. And I just want to mention one other thing about universities and the importance of the student involvement, because at the University of Virginia, the students were extremely, extremely vital and important in moving this dialogue into the forefront and making sure that the University of Virginia took responsibility for the past, what they had done to the enslaved workers. So, And they're still involved. Of course, many of them have graduated, but they're still involved with this process of trying to heal the, these deep wounds um, that, that have occurred in the past. So we can never underestimate the youth and especially the the uh, the alums of these universities. You're absolutely right. How do you think I got into the Ole Miss newspaper? The students contacted see? me. Yeah. Touche. So I and I see so many of them starting this work. They're starting to ask questions. Mm -hmm. That's and, and and really that's the whole function of them being at this place to begin with. Yeah. Is for them 
learn the art of asking a question, how to answer it, how to get the, you know, the skills needed to research, to pr provide yourself with the answer, to develop your opinions on what you do or you do not think, to have life experiences. If a child is going to college and they are not getting that, then we, I don't know what's going on with the school or the kid or whoever's guiding that person. But get that a was, refund. <laughs> yeah, you need to get a refund. But I, but I expect, I mean, and it was, it, it was so refreshing to me because you, I live in Tennessee, you guys. Old Miss is an institution here. Like it is like the Georgetown. Okay. Mm -hmm. People here only go to UT, University of Tennessee, mm -hmm. Old Miss, maybe Alabama. Mm -hmm. But academically, Alabama's not even in the same stratosphere as wow. Tennessee and Ole Miss. Like mm -hmm. it's just not. So to have these students, one of the young ladies was from Dallas. The other one had had uh, ancestry from Myanmar. Grew up in Philadelphia, Mississippi. These are mm -hmm. young folks who knew she knew what it meant for her to say that she was from Philadelphia, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. To sit them and have them here at my table, thinking critically about my ancestors tied to this and the fact that they knew that they were going around on campus questioning the names of buildings based off of the behavior of the people who the buildings were named after mm -hmm. that they could think mm -hmm. critically i i sat here and i told them i said look i want you to know i see you and every day you probably don't think that progress is taking place but the fact that you're at my table and we're having this discussion and you're putting out this special issue means that progress has happened mm -hmm. because if this was 10 or 15 years ago the staff probably wouldn't even have thought about it. You're so right. give give the young people, give them their credit. Um, Karen, talk about uh, Georgetown, how you, you got involved. You mentioned a little bit about your husband and his ties to it. Um, you know, I always have to make sure I shout out Miss Pat Bayon Johnson because I don't feel like enough people bring up her name with regard to the discussion of Georgetown and how her ancestors were a part of that and, um, and the research that was done by Judy Rifle. But uh, talk a bit about how you became involved with Georgetown 272. Absolutely. Well, I became involved when I saw the article in the New York Times and the, in the New York Times in, the, in May of 2016. And that article came about because the students at Georgetown started protesting when they found that Father McSherry and Father Mullody, uh, their names were on those buildings and that they were responsible for our ancestors being sold uh, to two men in Louisiana. Well, my husband uh, is a direct descendant of the Hawkins and Butler family that were a part of the sale. And you mentioned Patricia Bayon Johnson. She's a Butler descendant. Uh, Patricia was involved with doing research uh, some 12 years prior, and she had hired Judy Riffle as a, a genealogist to help her um, and her family in doing that research as well. And, uh, and so they knew about this, uh, this connection to the Jesuits. And certainly uh, they were miles ahead of the rest of us in knowing about this connection. So we, we later learn about um, all of them being, uh, that, that we're related to all, all of them as well. Uh, uh, so back to my husband. Uh, he's, as I said, related to the Hawkins and the Butler families. The Hawkins and the Butler families are related to almost everybody else that's a part of the sale. And uh, if you go to our website, gu272.net, we do have a list of all of the surnames. Uh, there are about 40 different surnames, but the Hawkins and the Butlers are two of the largest families among those surnames. Uh, and, and I won't go through all of the surnames, but they they um, they include other names such as Dorsey and Diggs mm -hmm. and Jones and Campbell and and many many others. Some people mentioned that they match some of the uh, DNA kits that the Georgetown Memory Project is managing. Judy Riffle is managing those those DNA kits, and certainly if someone thinks that they're connected to uh, the DNA kiss, they should contact Judy at the Georgetown Memory Project because um, she manages those DNA kits. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it has been uh, an amazing um, journey that we are all on because we are literally putting together what slavery has torn apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, the learning about this history has led to the descendant community 
reconnecting our family. And uh, I don't think any of us could have envisioned that this is possible to reconnect the pieces of family of uh, 272 people and to see us all come together. We're spread across many different states. And of course, DNA is showing us that we are connected. Those families that never left Maryland are connected to those who came to Louisiana. And, and, and many people, uh, we know that some of those Jesuits took some of those families from Maryland and moved to St. Louis, well, into the uh, St. Louis area uh, uh, around Florissant, Missouri. And then some of those in that Missouri area moved down to St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. And we're beginning to see some DNA connections from all of these places, from Maryland to Missouri, to St. Landry Parish, then to those three Louisiana parishes. That would be Iberville Parish, Ascension Parish, and Terrebonne Parish. So this is monumental to be able to reconnect these families. And that's what the GU 272 Descendants Association is about. So after finding out all of this, we created the GU 272 Descendants Association, and now I'm the executive director of that mm. association. Child, I'm just hoping. <laughs> With my 250, <laughs> I'm going to get them there. Because some, some of them, they just all are intertwined with these people. I was looking at the surname list on the site going, Lord, okay, yep, got that, got that, got that, <laughs> got that, got that. It was literally running down the list like, oh, that's my DNA, that's my DNA. Oh, they're a witness on a marriage. Oh, and I have this undiscovered tie on that side of my family with a free people of color family in Maryland and my folks are in the Florida parishes and I haven't mm -hmm. been able to reconcile how that happened. I, I'm just, I'm holding out faith. Carmen, Carmen says I'm related to everybody and connected to everything, which is <laughs> not are. true. I'm not, but <laughs> it would not make me mad if I was part of the Georgetown stuff. And, and I, I was going to add here because we've been in the chat room discussing it. Um, what Karen said is exactly what I'm trying to do with connecting my ancestors who were in Middlesex County uh, to our DNA cousins who ended up in Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi. I've so far been able to do that. Cousin Charisse is in the chat room. She she hits both sides of my family, but I've, I've made several DNA connections. So when you think about it, when you use DNA with your cousin matches, we're actually spitting in the face of slavery. We're doing mm -hmm. something that people said we couldn't do. So slavery wasn't as successful as people think it is when you start doing using your DNA cousin matches and you're able to, to trace how they migrated. And it's yeah. a powerful story that we all have that we need to be doing more of that. Well, and you know, I'll add a little yeast on what you just said, like my daddy would have said. Let me put a little <laughs> yeast on it. We weren't supposed to have access to this. Let's go there, because that rolls back to the last episode. We weren't supposed to have access to it because number one, we weren't supposed to be able to read and write because they knew because people knew that that was power. Second, genealogy was, remember, it was supposed to justify you not being of a defective right. uh, tree. Mm-hmm. So the very fact that we're involved and then now, as I as I continually say, when I speak across the country, I feel like the primary group that DNA is benefiting for genealogy are us mm -hmm, because yeah. it's the most accurate first person account available, period, point blank. That is not arguable. Now, it may take you years to find out the exact details, but you have a book right in front of you with blank pages and mm -hmm. and it's. The power for me, like I, I'm thinking people need to think more critically. If you have a group of folks like Miss Karen just threw out St. Louis, she threw out several parishes in Louisiana. She talked about Maryland, how people are crossing these state lines mm -hmm. and county and parish lines and sharing DNA with each other. And folks can't reconcile how that's happened. Go back to slavery. It is. That's the answer every single time. Literally, it is. And if you research the slaveholders and the potential people, follow every lead. Maybe you don't look up who, who your family's direct slaveholder is. Maybe it's somebody who's affiliated and that then leads you back to one of these larger groups. We mm -hmm. just stop being so tunnel minded and looking at our own folks. We don't go shoe shopping enough. Go shoe shopping with the <laughs> other folks' money. Mm -hmm. Right? And look mm -hmm. that stuff up. Mm -hmm. um, I so something, Nika. Go ahead, Shelly. 
back to when you were talking about the resources uh, and I posted in our chat here, the rental market was so huge in Virginia. Those records could be found. And you talked about researching who the slaveholders were in the area that because they were renting their slaves to the university. Mm -hmm. There's right. been documents that's been found on that. And the other thing, Jean Cooper, who did the book called, she's a librarian and a genealogist at UVA at the Alderman Library. She uh, did the book, uh, the index to the antebellum plantations or, or something like that. It's a gold mine for those of us that are researching slaves or, or plantations. It lays out a book of all the slave owners in a certain state down to a certain county. And so you can go through this book. But the reason I bring up her is because she does a blog on these students at UVA way, way, way back. So she's been digging and writing blogs. I think that's another opportunity <laughs> for people to check and see what biographies or some of these students during certain classes, maybe 1850, who graduated, who didn't, or whatever, find out who's local or where they might have went. And I think it might be information that could be found if people will just, like you said, branch out and look more, you know, because there's records out there that we don't even know about. You know, if you get the names of the students and you know the university knows the students that graduated and you're looking for those wealthy type families, which that's who they were, and start circling around downtown Charlottesville and Albemarle County, because even Jefferson had slaves that were helped build in that campus. It wasn't just the other ones, but he had slaves from his property as well. Something I would just add too is a lot of these, especially Southern planters or people who were in the South, sent their children up north to some yes. of these schools, mm -hmm. and they would, and the boys especially would bring boys back home for their sisters who would then marry these folks, right. and then here you have another uh, uh, generation of folks mm -hmm. being, you know, Northerners or you know, outsiders mm -hmm. and being wealth. brought down, yeah, and wealth, right, Standing being brought down. Way to sustain this operation. Um, I, I was mm -hmm. trying to figure out how a slaveholder on my mother's side, I was like, how in the world did he get down to Louisiana? Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. His brother-in-law was a student with him at Hanover uh, College. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I found them listed in the same graduating class. Yes. Wow. Oh, there you go. Someone mm -hmm. asked in the chat room, well, how do you get access to the school histories? A lot of them ask are not them. under copyright. <laughs> they Just Google, ask them. They're on it's Google there. Books. Or ask them yeah. at the school. They have yeah. they have these yeah. uh, these histories. So I wanted to add something here that most people don't consider. Um, I, years ago, I had old Dutch Reformed Church records, and when you look at these pre eighteen hundred Dutch Reformed Church records, not only did I find my ancestors listed, and and but. They also listed, again, I'm all about resurrected, not only my family, but other folks as well. There was also a list of, for example, the slaves of Gerardus Rutgers, the slaves of other people. So again, you know, don't keep it to yourself, resurrect a community. So I'm actually resurrecting the Middlesex County community that was early enough pre-Revolutionary War up until they some of them migrated to Newark. Uh, in the early 1800s. But again, old Presbyterian church records. And then if you're like my folks and you were church founders, colored Presbyterian, AME, AME Zion, Baptist, everything. But but always look at the churches, church records of the slave owners and the people who had money because chances are they were recorded. That's Nick, true. Go slaves. ahead, Miss Leontony. Could I say something just about also the spirit of the ancestors bringing us forth into um, mm -hmm. places we kind of never anticipated being? And one of the reasons I want to mention that is I had mentioned earlier that the University of Virginia in 1817, so 200 years ago, was established last year this time they had a 200th anniversary. It was a huge anniversary. It, you know, it went on for a couple of weeks. And um, at the most, probably the most fascinating part 
uh, concluding part is they had a huge concert on the lawn with over 20,000 people there. Yeah. And they asked and invited the descendants to come and to make a presentation. And I was privileged to be one of those individuals. So they had descendants from uh, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, yeah. African-American and white to, to speak. Well, just the African-Americans uh, went forward to speak. And for me, that was one of the most moving experiences that I've had in my life because I felt like I was able to give voice to redeem those mm. people who had been there, not just my ancestors, but all of the hundreds and the thousands of, of people of color who had labored for this university. And so each of us had a story to tell. So it's not just in the, in the archives and in the pieces of paper, but it's in the flesh and it's in our flesh to be able to say, once you hear that whisper, that's someone that's saying, please don't ignore what happened to me. Tell our story. And this is why I think it's so important. But for me, it, it, it really changed my life. It was phenomenal. And it wasn't by accident. 200 years later, you know, uh, 200 years earlier, we would have been never even allowed, not right. unless we were serving someone. So here we were to say we were here and you're here because our people were here. Um, I, the last question I have uh, before we wrap it up and go into Ask Mariah, uh, aunties, stay if you want to. You don't feel obligated to stay uh, if, you don't, if you don't want to. Um, but the last question I want to pose tonight is how can light be shed on colleges and universities outside of the Ivy League um, with their involvement with enslavement of people of African descent? Because we've thrown around a lot of names tonight and these places have portals as Shannon Christmas has, you know, um, alluded to in the uh, chat room. You know, you've got UVA's got an archive. Georgetown's got an archive. You've got, you know, a lot of these schools that have this, they have the endowment to be able to do these things, right? Or they can seek grants and funding for it. But what what about some of those smaller schools that exist and and you know you what do we do when those scenarios you know what i mean do we do we sit back and wait for somebody else to do it but you know what what's the appropriate way we talked about involving the student publication on, on campus or involving the students and and getting them educated on what happened but how how else can we shed light as researchers what is our role as researchers and descendants of these folks to to make sure that that any college and university that had a tie to slavery, you know, that those, that that is known in the public sphere. Mika, I think um, many of us are a part of genealogical societies. Uh, we should start bringing this up in our local genealogical society meetings. We all go to these conferences. Uh, we could do papers, uh, uh, submit uh, papers, do sessions at these conferences. Uh, just start putting it out there, elevating it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in our research, and as we're uh, encouraging other people to do genealogical research, encourage people to make sure that you don't forget about universities as a uh, source of information. And if you find your people in those records at the university, begin to lift up that information and uh, put it out there and share it as much as possible. Because uh, if you just looked at what's in the news, you would think uh, Georgetown and UVA and Harvard, and these are like the only places that are out there. We know that there are many others, but it, it takes us to lift this information up and put it out there. I, I agree with what Karen said, um, and I've s stated this before on a prior episode, one of the things I've been doing is working with downtown Rutgers uh, with a professor, uh, Junius Williams, where mm. he, uh, my uh, fourth great aunt married Jacob D. King, who had his underground railroad house in Newark in 1830. Mm. So we've been working with the students at Rutgers to, uh, and, and there's a great website that Professor Williams has put together. Um, and the students there are actually, some of them have made an interactive, almost like video game, showing how uh, uh, my fourth great grandfather who was a stagecoachman, helped his son-in-law 
who uh, who was the Underground Railroad uh, station master, you know, transport fugitive slaves. OK, so we have an opportunity to reach out to students and get mm -hmm. young people in. I'm so happy to see my new cousin, Alex, um, <laughs> you know, motivating, just being at his school and and. Yeah. And being able, I have another young cousin, Dennis Richmond, who's doing stuff with HBCU. So we we need to bring the younger generation in. We need to instill a passion in doing genealogy. And it, it's something all of us could do, as well as doing our own outreach to our own genealogical societies uh, and communities. Church I, groups. I would, I, mean, say, I would say, too, I, I think there needs to be a bridge between the old methods and the new methods, just like you just mm -hmm. talked about, uh, Teresa. And mm -hmm. I think it to be innovative with this and to capture their interest, to me, when you approach young people about this, it's not so much from the perspective of, I want you to dig through the records. It's maybe their skill set is STEM and they know how to code mm -hmm. video games, or maybe they can help you with your website. A lot of university teachers are looking for students to have projects that they can become passionate about and learn something, not just I learned Perl or C++. No, I actually got something in addition to it. I learned about this whole chapter of history that I didn't know about. Um, and 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 go in that way. Go If they have a media department, if they've got radio, they've got television, they've got publications, that's a great way because those students are already being trained. How in the world do you think I got into genealogy? My degree is in communications. I went to school for journalism. That's how I know how to dig good because you're always trying to find the scoop. Those are naturally the first students you need to approach because they can dig. They're going to vet the story. They're being taught how to write. I don't, I'm serious. Maybe I need to share the link to the story that young man wrote. That was out of a, a 10 minute conversation. That young man put that story together and put some, put some yeast on it to, to, to today. <laughs> it's amazing job. Those young ladies yeah. were sitting, the pictures took five minutes and they mm -hmm. put that all together excellently. So trust young people, especially yeah. some of us who are older. We don't trust them with the information. Let's talk about that. We don't trust them with it because we think it's ours. We mm -hmm. want to hold on to it. We want to be the one to tell the story when you can't even put together a blog and this child is sitting in front of you expressing to you that they want to participate and they want to be involved, but because you are so sheltered off and closed off, you won't even give them the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I agree with you, Mika. And, and I think it's so important that, um, that students are involved. I know I can just speak just for one example at the, at the University of Virginia, we have what they call the Cornerstone Summer Institute and it is student led. They bring their ideas, their technology, because one of the things that we, that we must do is institutionalize this research, uh, this history that once we're gone and they're gone, that it's sustained. But the other thing that I wanted to mention is the uh, PCSU has become a new commission at the University of Virginia. And it now it's, it's the university in the age of segregation, but the co-chair of that is uh, Dr. Kurt Von Dack. And now he's working with Kenyatta Berry to link digital projects and mm -hmm. to create a relational shit, you know, relational database. Those are the type of things that we have to encourage the youth to do. Again, it has to be in them. So I, I feel very um, good about the direction in which we're moving and our, our young people are moving. They're really driving this train. And I like where they're going at the University of Virginia, you know, in terms of the memorialization and the database and and the contemporary science and research that, uh, like you said, sometimes the old people need to move out of the way as long as we get the end result that is desired, but let them drive. Because we're getting Alex, too old to drive. <laughs> come on now. Miss Daisy had to be driven around now. <laughs> Bring it home. <laughs> We get too old. Hey, what you said now, I know there's going to come a point where I can't pick this up. And, you know, and I'm thinking about that now. What's my succession plan? Don't just think about it for your own personal research, but for this large project family. that I family. have for your fit. Because this is this is our family. The Georgetown 272 is Karen's family. The UVA enslaved descendants is Leontini's family. The Trash 250, that that's my family, Right. Think about a contingency plan. Maybe we just have to be mindful of that. Alex, what were you going to say, baby? 
Definitely. <laughs> it's crazy to jump in after all of that. My biggest <laughs> thing is going away from university, going away from, from institutional and all of this work that our students do or all of these scholars do. There's a certain thing called access. And we really have to think about how our community has been barred from so, mm. from so much of this, right? So when we think about access. Oh, Lord, right? you preaching. I'm sorry. I got to interrupt you. OK, hold on. Keep going. We're not all going to, you know, we're not all going to the universities. The reason why I have my skills, I'll tell you the truth. I was raised mostly by my grandparents, my great grandparents. My parents were significantly older when I was born. So therefore I had access to all of these stories. But then I also had access to computers, to books, something that most African-American statistically Families don't really have at home, especially during the time that I was coming up. Now that is changing in the in the generation following me. However, we have to really think about that and who has access to these universities to do this work. Because I guarantee you, some of those trash um, uh, descendants, some of these Georgetown descendants, some of these UVA descendants, they out here in the hood, just like some of us grew up. And they're not going to these universities. So I agree with all of you guys 100%. I also want to add that we also have to do re how to have to do outreach outside of our genealogical community. We have to do research outside of these societies. I'm gonna tell you right now. I applied for a genealogical society um, monthly, like the, an, a, a journal that comes out each month. I couldn't afford it. Okay, this is when I was about 17. I can afford it now. But think about what that would have meant to me at 17 and where that would have gotten me in my own research. But now I'm spending money going back through all of these and having to travel. We have to think about how we're fund how we're funneling our information and our knowledge and our passion mm -hmm. and the significance of everything that we do to communities that aren't going to be well versed in knowing what any of this is even about. So I think that that's really important. And especially when we think about universities in general, I feel like that also pulls these communities into universities to be able to do this work also. So just keeping that in mind, because these descendants exist. Myself, I found in my own family that the Catholics own my family. We have an ancestor named Jolly Coer that literally built St. Francisville Catholic Church with his hands. And yet it took me discovering that. And now we know that about 300 people living today are descended from this person. And mm -hmm. the Catholic Church benefited from that for over 300 years now. So let's just think about the way that, that this goes outside of the university and, all, and these other institutions and how these communities are really being affected. You said the buzzword of St. Francisville. When we stopped the episode, I got something I got to tell you that I found out. Another run it. Yeah, because you're going to be <laughs> up all night long when you find this out. Um, I think everybody is bringing up amazing point. Um, we have to reach out, reach in. We've got to expand our spirit. Can't just be at the universities or at the, you know, university level or within our genealogical institutions. You know, it, it's got to be. I, that's one of the reasons why I love that the Georgetown group had a reunion back where you know, it was, it was kind of merged, you know, or, or it's kind of home base was because that's something in our culture that we're used to. We're used to coming to reunions, but this was from a different vantage point. These were new people. This was, this was a history that some of the folks may not have been super familiar with, but it was beautiful to see because that was not something we had access to. Remember DNA, access to records, right? Proliferation of online records, access to DNA testing because it was, you know, it was too expensive. I mean, there's so many aspects of this where, you know, remember we had defective ancestry. We were not supposed to get this. And mm -hmm. now that we have the power, we have to continue to turn it on its head and, and just make it what it is. So, you know, the, the, the system is going to tell you your research is faulty, that you don't have what it takes to do, their records aren't available. And, and we have 70 shows saying that that's not true. Mm -hmm. Here is yet another one. So um, from the bottom of my heart, I feel like this was an amazing episode. I'm going to be sharing it forever. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, new aunties, Miss Leontine Clay Peck, Ms. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen Harper Royal. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We love you. If you ever want to come back on any other topics, you feel free. You just say, I want to come on that one. That's all you got to do is email. And uh, let you. us know. <laughs> Anything you all want to say to close out before we move into Ask Mariah? 
I would just say thank you so much for um, inviting me. I've enjoyed it. Um, anytime that I can come back, I certainly will come back, but just a heartfelt thank you. You're welcome. We love to have you, Miss Carrie. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I'm a big fan. And so it's uh, just so exciting to be on as a guest. And I look forward to coming on again. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, panelists, you know, it's your favorite time where I drive you crazy. Oh, before we get there. Yeah. Cause you know, ask Mariah people. Yeah. They're chomping at the bit to get to that, but we want to go over some viewer comments for the evening. Um, Bernice Bennett, of course, one of our panelists reminds everyone to check out medical apartheid, the dark history of medical mm -hmm. experimentation on black Americans from colonial times to the present by Harry a Washington. Amazing book. Very hard read though. Um, to me, it's on the same level as Dana Ramey Bay. Barry's book. Um, very hard read, but very good information in there. Shannon Christmas uh, mentions Princeton University, previously known as the College of New Jersey, was the school of choice for Southern men of, plant of the planter class. So no one should be surprised by Princeton's role. Very good point. Judy Riffle mentions Catholic records have slave baptismal records. Absolutely. We mentioned churches a lot tonight. Hello, the Jesuits were, a, that's the church. So it's, it's, it's a faith, okay? That's the whole basis of the Georgetown 272. Sharice Louie mentions cousin matches are so much more valuable than ethnicity estimates. She is absolutely right. All right, now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Ask Mariah, this is the part of the show where you, the viewer, submit your questions, queries, conundrums, and more to the panel. And we weigh in live with research help specifically geared towards you. Panelists never see the queries beforehand. So you get to see, you get a chance to see us work together live to help our genie buds. Tonight, ask Mariah, and we'll see if you're in the uh, chat room. I don't see Miss Sheila. I'm um, going to get a little bit of reverb. I don't know who that is. True, if you can mute everybody for me, please. All right. Um, where is Arthur Johnson? All right, this is our Ask Mariah. Sheila Smith is asking about Arthur Johnson. Arthur Johnson, born about 1845 in Louisiana, located 1880 census in Lauderdale, Mississippi. Not found in another census outside of 1880. So we're looking for Arthur Johnson, born 1845, located in Lauderdale, Mississippi in the 1880 census. The educable child census or educable child uh, children's um, list for the state of Mississippi. Um, he was still in Lauderdale, Mississippi. So that's another record. It's just not a census, so to speak. I mean, it is, but it isn't by name, rather. He married in Clark County, Mississippi, December 1869 to Sarah Ann Allen. 1879, a uh, son named John Arthur was born in Mobile. 1890, son Lonnie was uh, was born. 1892, a son Elliot born in Hines County. That's Jackson, Mississippi. This is four generations uh, of paternal Johnsons. Arthur died about 1897. Just off the top, this is a whole lot of moving. If you do any sort of research in this area, it's like, wait a minute. How in the world did he go from Louisiana to Lauderdale, Mississippi? Then we're in Lauderdale. Then we're in Clark County. Then after we go to Clark County, we go to Mobile. And then we go to Hines County. That's a whole lot of moving. It's a whole lot of moving. So keep an eye on that panelist. In terms of other information she's got, she's got the marriage certificate from Clark County. So at least she did do the on-site research or, you know, some semblance of that. So she's got some leads there. 1880 census. She's got a military record for his son, John Arthur, and death records of three children listing Arthur Johnson as a parent from Illinois. Hmm. A parent from Illinois. Yeah. All right. I hear, I hear some fussing. Who's fussing? <laughs> I just gave it a hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of loose ends here. It it's not it's sounding uh Shelly asked about coal miners. I ain't never heard of no coal miners in Louisiana. Maybe I'm crazy, but mm -hmm. I ain't never heard of no and we ain't got mountains. We I was about to say we ain't got no mountains. Not no, I, I mean, think we're further up in Alabama, maybe, but not maybe, in, but not not along the Gulf Coast. <laughs> there <you> nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, no call on the gumbo. Yeah, that's all. Like I just, it's, it's, it. I don't know. I can't reconcile. For me personally, I just can't reconcile all this moving. Like if you literally put in all these places, right? Was he working on a railroad? Maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, the question that I would have is what 
were her sources for all of these places. And if they are coming from, one of the mistakes that I feel a lot of people uh, make with getting death records as sources of birthplaces, um, sometimes the informant may not really know where they were actually from. Um, some people will say, oh, somewhere in Mississippi. Some people will give you an exact county. Some people will, it'll be an in-laws cousin in them that gave the informant. So. I think that that's an important thing to look at is just seeing who was actually around to be a primary source. Yeah, they, um, and Tyrone Croft, I think you're right. The way it was worded was a little awkward. Uh, the children's death certificates were in Illinois. Um, so that sounds like maybe Cook County deaths um, or something like that was accessed maybe on Family Search. Um, you know, that's a database where, um, you know, if you're doing you know, Louisiana research. I don't know how anybody just uses the Louisiana deaths on ancestry. I absolutely have to have the one from family search open because it can provide the names of the parents. And so typically I will just prove somebody, you know, attaching that death record to a person if the parents are not right. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't know that unless you cross reference both of those things. Um, I'm gonna attempt to go and find him on the 18, uh, 1880 census. Um, any suggestions, you all? You could think of trying to reconcile some of the information. That's what Alex just talked about. Yeah, I mean, the, knowing what kind of work he did would be really important. So you could the, you could see whether this actually fits that all of this movement, you know, and the children seem like they're going to be the where you can probably pull the most information. Hopefully, verify some of these locations. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. Okay, let's see. All right, so I did Dude, find the... Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, are go we, ahead. Are we assuming he was um, born enslaved? Uh, mm. I guess based off of age, yes. Um, 1845. 1845. Yeah. That he was not a free person of color. I think so. I think we're assuming that. Okay. And then there's like that 20-year gap. Okay between that and the 1869, and then you got another 20 year gap from a document. So are those like rel different relationships or they're just the same family or even, or just people with the same name? But I mean, I don't, yeah, that's a lot of time. Let's see, so I'm just the, throwing a map yeah. in to see how, how far we're talking here. Okay, so Clark County is just south of Lauderdale. So that's not out of the cards. Awkward. Um, I think for me that that Hines County was from Mobile is a big jump. From Mobile, Alabama. That's that's not like Mobile to New Orleans. Okay. That's 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 far. Why? One of the things that I would just say to that is if we can find that 1880 census and just see if maybe there's a consistency of people that are actually from Louisiana or from Mississippi that go to each of these areas, then that would make sense because sometimes you had um, sharecroppers, sometimes you had people in collective occupations that would move around or you know land would open up here in this county. Um, and that way people can move that far and that often, but that's that's kind of reverse migration going on. I don't I don't know about that. It seems like she did some of the basic things, you know, based on what she gave, mm -hmm. but I still think I agree with Ellen that occupation might help with some of this movement. But then again, um, didn't she say something about these three children that listed him as father? And were they, the question would be, where were each of those children born? And where's mama or wife? And I would probably start tracking the last wife and and seeing if he's around in that same county or or something well this that to me this is kind of it's interesting because in in her query she does not list these other children that are on the census mm -hmm. form and there's not another person named arthur johnson in lauderdale county 
at least spelled with this spelling. You know what I'm saying? It could be another spelling, but he's got a wife named Sarah. And based off of off of what we know, uh, based off of what she provided, um, I, yeah, like why has she vetted Luella, Virginia, Emily, Letty, right. and Thomas? Mm-hmm. You, you know, gotta and, search the whole family. Yeah, yeah. like you gotta mm-hmm. search the whole family. And I didn't flip to the next page to see if you know. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know about y'all, this but my folks are this, always at the top. That's really bottom. interesting. Yeah. But where and is the Laura too? Said he was born in um, what was it? Born in Virginia and winds up in Louisiana. No, ma'am. He was born in Louisiana, oh. but both oh, of his parents yeah. were born in Virginia. Oh, okay. Okay, that's really small. Okay. And how old? I wonder how old those kids are. If she's claiming he died in 1897 in Mississippi, like how you know? There are three, four, six, like, and eight. Are you trying to tell me that the kids are born after or before? Well, that? she's saying she's saying the sons that it appears mm-hmm. that she knows about, they weren't born until 1879. Mm-hmm. Right. Hmm. Allegedly. So where is this 1879 John Arthur? I'm not I, seeing his name on here on this census. So how does she know that she is the right person if he was born in 1879? This is the 1880 census. Is he on the next page? No, ma'am. Or no, sir. There's a oh. daughter. So I do Netflix. find I find John John Arthur in the um, Social Security applications, and then an actual um, two two World War draft records, and mm-hmm. they have inconsistent information. Now the birth date is the same; it's all the third of December, eighteen seventy nine. One says Mobile, the other say. Um, let me go back to the other one. One says Mar- um, Hines, Mississippi, with a woman named Marguerite, and then um, the other one, I believe, the World War Two draft gives an additional information so that's kind of confusing with those movements this could be this person on all of these records is the same but it's not confirming this person's tie to the 1880 census at all so i agree with you nika i think this is this is on-site research i think Um, this is on-site like because how do you know you have the right arthur johnson all these kids like how do all the kids just fall off and die but then we only are talking about the boys yeah, that's what kind of threw me off. Yeah, because I'm finding several Arthur Johnsons in Louisiana in the 1870 who are black, but they have different um, wives' names, um, which could be. But with not with that with not having anything else to go on, it's hard to know if one of them could be him. Is Saint Mary near this area? Saint Mary Parish? No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. Okay. You You're know, by Choctaw, Louisiana. Alabama. You're talking about Meridian, Mississippi. Yeah, it's Meridian. So it's it's yeah. like it's right next to the state line of, right. of Mississippi and um yeah. and, and there's Alabama. movement between because I do research in Lauderdale and the movement from enslaved and free is from Alabama into Mississippi. They are back and forth. Either you're born in Mississippi, then you get raised in Alabama, or you're born in Alabama and you get raised in uh, Mississippi. Alex, I wanted to ask you, did it say what occupation he had on his draft registration? On John Arthur's, um, on his on his World War II, it does not specifically say that. It, it li- does list an employer. Um, but then on World War One, if you give me a second, I can go back to it. Um, let's Could see. I'm going to be a traveling to minister. <laughs> For him to be born in Louisiana in 1845, how does he get loose? Yeah, like how, like, because you know we're talking, you know, lower level. Mississippi at this point, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. these folks that are in this area, they're going to probably come from the Florida parishes. I would imagine. Cause that's, that's kind of what's closest on here. You know what I mean, if you're, if theorizing Louisiana, um, I don't know. I just feel like she, she has to verify she's got the right people. Yeah. I'm not sure that Johnson, Arthur Johnson is the same one and everything she's picking up. So I was able to find for John Arthur, it, he is listed as a railroad porter, so most likely a Pullman uh-huh. porter um, in in the World War One census. Okay. And it says that he's based out of Natchez, Mississippi. 
Okay. Um, okay. So that makes more sense. Okay. Right. I saw that, one there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes we, more sense. And we also have to think about how the distance between Natchez, Mississippi, Hines, if that goes together that well. Far. But yeah. then going over to like Meridian, that's not even the same. No. It's it's not the same kind of You gotta go up vibe. that coast. So we also could think maybe John Arthur was was some kind of was Rolling Stone and didn't want to be, you know, didn't want to be one person all the time. But I'm I'm not entirely sure about this one. Well, um, we don't mess, there, we don't mess with there a child named Leanna? Uh like on the eighteen eighty there is a Luella. Oh, uh, that's Born close. 10, yeah, 10 years old. So she would be a baby in 1870, approximately. Also on her death certificate, is she's listening, she needs to look and see who the witnesses are and the informant and find out if these informant people have some connection. Might not yeah. be a sibling or a spouse or something, but it could be relations some kind of a way. Yeah, I, I, the reason why we're having such a re reaction to this is because <laughs> when you have people that are Delta folks, yeah, the Delta yeah. and the Gulf people are like, we are real territorial. We don't ever, you don't cross reference back into deep Mississippi. Like we just, I've never seen where that happens. Like usually <laughs> Delta folk, am I lying though? We no, you get up out of Mississippi. Line. That's what I'm saying. Like we get, we hightailing out. Like we're not. You staying. better go to Point Capay, New Orleans. That's what I'm Baton saying. Like somebody, people, you ain't going back to go to like a larger city, which is why, like, I can see going to Jackson. But this move from Mobile, why would you leave Mobile? Like, it just, I just, I, I think this is on-site research. I think this is, you know, doing um, a deep and thorough search, and and part of this is reconciling the information that you already have. And that's the reason why we're all very skeptical, so to say, so to speak, or not really trying. You know what I mean? It's kind of hard for us to follow is because you need to vet what you have. Do you have at least three pieces of information that say that this Arthur Johnson is yeah. your Arthur Johnson, that you know definitively that he was born in Louisiana? You probably, you know, you may not because this is the only census you have him on. But have you gone locally to look in Lauderdale? Because that seems like that is a place that he he was he was at for an extended period of time. Have you gone to the Mississippi State Archives? What have you looked at outside of on online records? Because some of these things you can't get answers to unless you go local. Right. Um, yeah. And you still have to, you have to reconcile everything that you have because it, if it, it appears all over the place, um, any other suggestions before we move on to current I events? Have, you want? I have one. Um, so this is really broad and it may be a reach, but you can look in that County for, I noticed that on that 1880 census, it has his parents from Virginia, I believe. Mm -hmm. You can look in that County for some other Johnson's, maybe a few pages over and see if there's any other Johnsons that shows Virginia. And then there's also a maiden name on one of these records for Sarah. Um, so maybe even looking for some of her people and seeing if they did that same migration or there's something similar in that next generation, that may help just slightly. Um, look at the neighbors and see if we can locate the neighbors on the 1870. There could be a name change. Johnson yep. is one of those That's common the ones, so it's a reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it looks like for Sarah, her parents were born in South Carolina. Um, she was born in Mississippi, so I would try to track her down as a 16-year-old, just see where she's at um, in 1870. Another tactic we all use when you can't find somebody in 1870 is look for the neighbors on that previous census. Um, look, you know, for the pages around, see if you can locate them. And then you might be able to find your folks maybe with a different name or uh, whatever. Um, uh, someone I, mentioned, Neff, Neff Hawthorne mentions the Pullman Porter Museum database. Um, looking there, um, Shannon, Shannon says, make sure all these census records refer to the same person that you said. <laughs> I, would also not, I would also not rule out um, free people of color. So I would suggest mm -hmm. checking the free people of color registries and also mm -hmm. newspaper, um, do some newspaper search and see if you might come up with anything. I will never turn down newspapers. They are a mm -hmm. gold mine. We don't Absolutely. use them enough. We're going to have a whole show about that next year because we Yay. don't utilize them enough. I love newspapers. All right. So do you have a research brick wall? Would you like help from Black Progen scaling that wall? Submit your query today for our Ask Mariah segment. The link is in the description of each and every episode of Black Progen Live. Remember to be specific. Be specific. 
if it's Arthur Johnson and one census has an ER and the other has UR, tell us that because otherwise we're going to be running around crazy trying to find what you said you already found. Um, <laughs> and tell us everything you search so we don't duplicate efforts if you get selected. And cross your fingers when you press submit, you just may get chosen for one of our upcoming episodes. Current events, Preserving Communities of Color Conference is taking place November 1st through the 3rd, 2018. This conference will explore the social, institutional, and economic changes that impact communities of color across the nation and is jam-packed with speakers that are blazing a trail of disruption as they work to build and inclusive communities. They will share the under, undertold stories of these important places and the inspirational journey to preserve communities of color by revitalizing them into inclusive spaces or places and cultural destinations. November 1st theme is planning and community engagement and will allow attendees to explore the different ways people are working to preserve communities of color. Speakers will share and explore planning models and community engagement strategies. November 2nd theme is displacement and gentrification. Strategies will focus on the important topic of displacement. Across America, people of color are being forced out of communities they once called home to make room for newcomers who have no ties to the existing neighborhood. Speakers will share their own stories of displacement, highlighting the erasure of culture and heritage. And on November 3rd, the last day of the conference, the theme is economic development and cultural heritage. Tourism, which is which will focus on uh, economic development, including the idea of cultural heritage, tourism, and placemaking. The day will feature hands-on workshops hosted by experienced teams of people who track uh, with a track record of building economic success in their respective communities. It's hosted at the Spring Hill Suites in Houston um, and students are free. Uh, and there is a registration fee um, that is required for this. I think it's $189. Um, for more info, visit communities, excuse me, preserving communities of color.org. We talked about Henrietta Lacks earlier. Uh, Miss Leontini talked about her. Decades after take, taking Henrietta Lacks's sales without consent, Johns Hopkins names a building after her. Johns Hopkins University says it will honor Henrietta Lacks, the African-American woman whose cancer cells continue to have an impact on medicine more than 60 years after they were taken without her consent. The announcement was part of the ninth annual Henrietta Lacks Memorial Lecture, which the university has drawn about a thousand people each year to learn and reflect on Lacks's legacy. Lacks, a young young African-American mother of five from Virginia, died in 1951 after being diagnosed with cervical cancer at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. As told in Rebecca Sloot's best-selling book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, doctors took cells from Lacks without her knowledge during her cancer treatment. They discovered the cell's remarkable ability to keep growing, something that had never been seen before. And this is beyond past due <laughs> for happening um, with her. Um, yet for decades, even as John Hopkins and other major research institutions relied on HeLa cells for innumerable studies and discoveries, the identity of the woman behind the cells was largely unknown, including to her own family. This is from the uh, Johns Hopkins president, Ronald Daniels. The building that's going to be named after her will adjoin the Berman Institute of Bioethics, Deering Hall, and will face the northern end of uh, Eager Park, serving as an entryway to the community. Last current event, and I'm actually sort of excited about this, Tour de Force and veteran actor Samuel L. Jackson is set to host a six-part Canadian docuseries called Enslaved, which will look at slavery through the lens of underwater archaeology. Yes, like Jacques Cousteau, but for us. The development and premiere of the documentary will coincide with the 400 year anniversary of the first documented African slave being brought to the new world. For me, this is much more than a television series, Jackson said. For me, Enslaved is an attempt to give a voice to the millions whose voices were silenced. Enslaved will be produced by Samacha Jakovovich. Ooh, I said that wrong. Sama Simcha Jakob. I should have practice this. Laura can't say the last name. An Israeli Canadian film director and journalist known for films like Deadly Currents and The Exodus Decoded. No release date has been announced for uh, Enslaved as of yet. And um, they have gotten distribution um, in areas excluding US and Canada. So I'm hoping this will probably make it to Netflix for us or something else. All right, our next episode, Runaway Self-Liberated Africans, Their Surjoins in the Americas and the Underground Railroad. The story of the enslaved often doesn't focus on those who resisted the institution and fought to end it. In this episode, we'll discuss uprisings, revolts, and movements intended to liberate those who were unwilling chattel slaves in the Americas. It'll be airing live Tuesday, November 6, 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Did you know we only have three shows left? 
for 2018. Can you believe it? I know it's crazy. Make sure you don't miss a single one. Head to whoisnikasmith.com for a downloadable schedule. And don't forget to set your reminders. Also, don't forget to tune into the archive of the long running research of the National Archives and beyond. This Thursday, there's actually a new show, October 25th. The topic is Louisiana Creole genealogy. Oh, the irony, right? That we're talking, we've been talking about Louisiana all night. Uh, the topic this week is Louisiana Creole genealogy with Rodney Sam. Rodney Sam will discuss the uniqueness of Louisiana Creole genealogy and a personal journey to learn about his Louisiana Creole heritage. Tune in this Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Also, don't forget to check out the African Roots podcast hosted by Black Pro Gen Life panelist Angela Walton Raji. Visit AfricanRootsPodcast.com for her episode archive. Uh, don't forget, join the conversation. We love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Participate in the live chat. Thank you so much, chatters, for being there, just letting it go by just so easily and chiming into the conversation. The, ch the chat is archived. So if you are watching this recording, be sure to click the live replay button so that you can see it as it took place as the show happened. Also, be sure to weigh in on Twitter by tweeting us at Black Pro Gen or use the hashtag Black Pro Gen. All right, True, going to pass it to you to All close right. us out. <laughs> Thank you, Nika. This was a very informative and exciting episode. And I hope you all will go back and um, replay it. And if you're watching us on the replay, I want to thank those viewers too for coming in afterwards. So we appreciate you coming in and checking on us after we're live. And Queen Leontony and Miss Karen, I just want to say thank you. Um, it is so much appreciated and we love you. And like Nika said, come on back anytime you're ready. And to all my panelists, y'all are awesome. Nika puts it together and all we have to do is show up and show out. So I just want to thank everyone and have a good night and we'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs> Black Progen Live. Black Progen. Black Progen Live. Black Progen. Hello, everybody Black, out there. Black Progen Live. Black Progen Pro Pro Live. Pro 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 the unapologetic Black and people of color viewpoint. The place where evidence tells the stories.